All right, so if we were teaching computing for computational literacy as a way of learning other things and a way of teaching everybody about computing, how would that look different? So let me give you a couple of examples. Let me start out pretending that you are freshmen in my media computation course, where I'm going to now teach you about digital sound, all right? So pretend you don't know anything about computing, you don't know anything about digital sound, and I'm gonna start out explaining how sound works. So right now, my vocal cords are bouncing against air molecules, and air molecules are elastic, so they, my, they, they bounce together, and there's an increase in air pressure, and we can see this, we can graph this and talk about an increase in air pressure, and and then the air molecules bounce apart and there's a decrease in air pressure. And the height of the, we can track this wave of the air pressure increasing and decreasing and coming back to baseline. The height of this wave is the amplitude that roughly corresponds to the volume. And the number of cycles per second, the number of time goes up and down and back to baseline, um, that indicate that's a, a, rep a representation, it's a connected to pitch. Uh, so for example, A above middle C is 440 hertz, 440 cycles per second. Okay, if you are anything like my freshman, you are now asleep. This is the most boring thing in the world. So let me show it to you in a different way. So this is GP. Um, it is a block-based programming language. It's super powerful. It's being developed by John Maloney, the original uh, implementer of Scratch. Um, and what I can do, you can see the, the blocks-based code here. I'm gonna go ahead and execute this. Um, GP is the first block space language that is fast enough, powerful enough that I can do this kind of thing right now. What we're currently looking at is a visualization of the increases and decreases in air pressure as it hits the microphone on my laptop at this very moment. So let me give you a couple of demonstrations. All right, I want you to watch what happens to the waveform when we have a really low pitched sound and when we have a really high pitched sound ignore the amplitude because it's pretty hard to control my volume like this but just look at the width of the waves low high low pitched sounds are fat there's very few of them in unit time because they're very thick um, high pitched sounds there's a lot of them per unit time. They're really skinny. Low pitch sounds, low frequency, fewer waves. High pitch sounds, higher frequency, more waves in unit time. Let me give you another way of looking at this. This is a fast Fourier transform. Uh, if you don't know what a fast Fourier transform is, it's okay, I don't either, but I know how to demonstrate it. Frequency increases from left to right. And the height of the wave is an indication of how much energy uh, at that frequency. So uh, a fast Fourier transform is showing about if we added up a whole bunch of sine waves, we could make the original sound, and what would the frequencies of those sound waves be? A whistle is almost a perfect sine wave. So it increases in pitch from left to right. Now, musical sounds, so you can see right now that most sounds are an, a com combination of a lot of different sine waves. Sounds that sound musical to our ear tend to have a fixed pattern of tones and overtones. Ah, ah. And then musical instruments tend to similarly have a set of tones and overtones. What, you don't bring a harmonica to computer science class? So um, one of the th cool things that we could do in the class is actually add up sine waves at these different frequencies to try to use additive synthesis to generate a sound that sounds like a harmonica or something else. Now, a wind instrument like a harmonica, as long as I have breath, I can hold the particular tones and overtones. Instruments that are basically vibrations that are plucks on a string, like a piano, or that's a hammer on a string, or um, a, a guitar or an ukulele, are harder to see that because the, the tones are gonna fade over time. Um, I just happen to have an ukulele right here. Um, so watch what happens here. Now, I can see the tones and overtones, but they fade out right away, so they're harder to see. So let me give you one other representation of sound that we can play with. So this is a sonogram view. So 
sort of audio etch-a-sketch. Um, the pitch increases from top to bottom, and the darkness is the amount of energy at that pitch. So now we can see the tones and overtones really clearly. Here's the harmonica again. And now we can see more clearly what's going on with the ukulele. We can see the tones and overtones and then the decay over time. So that's how sound works. So sound is this waveform going up and down and all over the place. Now, uh, how do we put that inside the computer? The computer is just a whole bunch of numbers. So we have a way of doing this. Um, I, I remind my students that they all took integral calculus despite their best efforts to forget it. And so they remember that we can estimate a, a curve by creating a bunch of little rectangles. Um, we're going to call each of those rectangles a sample. So we can manipulate sound by capturing the waveform, the air pressure, at regular intervals, essentially creating these little rectangles, and then storing that list of numbers of pressure values. We call these samples. So a typical sound might be captured 44,000 times per second. That's the, uh, the way that we might do digital sound. So let's manipulate some digital sound. OK. so. Um, I've got some sounds loaded up here, and I'm going to make a sound right now. This is a test.wave, okay? And I'm gonna explore that sound. And this is actually a graph of the increases and decreases in air pressure. I can play the whole thing. This is a test. And you can basically tell where the four words, this is a test, are. So if I put a cursor here and play before. This is. And then I can play afterward. A test. Okay, so how do we make the sound bigger? We know the amplitude corresponds to the volume. So if we take each of these numbers, which is a positive to negative roughly 32,000, 32,767, 30, negative 32,768, um, if we multiplied each of them by a constant greater than one, then the whole waveform stretches, it becomes bigger. So I've got a piece of code that can do that to increase the volume in the sound. For each sample of in the sound, get that sample value, positive, negative, 32,000, and multiply it by four. So I'm now going to increase volume of T, and then explore T. OK. Here was my original sound. This is a test. And here's my new one. This is a test. I hope I convinced you that that's louder. We could do it a few more times if you like, but we'll just pause from there. It certainly looks bigger, right? And hopefully it sounds bigger as well. True story. First time I've ever teaching this course, guy in the back of the class shouts out, what if you set all the sample values to 32,000, what would you get? Well, you'd actually get silence, right? Because we hear changes in air pressure. We hear increases and decreases. If it's all at 32,000, well, that's the same as them all being zero. There's no variation. We can't hear anything. But I said, I'm, I'm willing to make you a deal. Um, I've been wanting to teach you about if statements anyway. So I wrote this piece of code. OK, so what it says is, for each of the samples in the sound, get that value out. And if the value is at all positive, make it 32,600, one of the very loud, highest values we possibly could. If the value is negative, make it the, the, the most negative value that we can, the greatest absolute value in the negative direction. All right, so I'm gonna run this code for you right now. Um, first, I'm gonna go back and get the original sound so that you know I'm not playing around here. And here's the sound again. This is a test. Okay, and now I'm going to maximize this sound and now explore it, okay. Here again was our original sound. This is a test. Before I press this button, I'm going to ask everybody watching the video right now to th ask yourself, what are we going to hear? Now, a very specific question I want you to ask yourself. Are we going to hear the words, this is a test? If you think we are going to hear the words, this is a test, wherever you're at right now, it might look silly. Maybe you're in a bus. It's OK. Give me a thumbs up. If you think that we are not going to hear the sound, give me a thumbs down. It's actually important for you to have your, your thumb in the air in front of you as I'm about to press the button. So I'm going to wait a minute so everybody can put the, you ready? Okay, uh, you too, all right? Everybody got your thumbs up, your thumbs down? Good, okay. 
This is a test. Look at your thumb. All right. I'm going to bet some of you guessed this. Most of you guessed this based on my experience. Why were we able to hear the words, this is a test? And uh, I can do it again. This is a test. Just to make sure that you really do believe that we heard the words, this is a test. Well, while the amplitude is as messed up as it possibly can be, it crosses over in time, crosses zero, at the exact same place. Right? That part we have, we have kept the same. And it turns out that that part, mm, that's the part that helps us understand speech. So let me talk to you a little bit about this piece of code. First of all, why was it important for you to have the thumb in front of you as, as, we, uh, as we played that? Because there's some really wonderful work by Eric Mazur, who's a physicist at Harvard, and he's done experiments asking the question, when you do demos in physics class, what's the impact of the demo? And in physics, I mean, they could do all kinds of cool demos. They can have weights and water and things going down ramp and fire and explosions. Well, maybe not fire, but maybe. Um, and what he found was that if you ask students to make a prediction, they're more likely to learn from the demo. The amazing thing is, is that the worst learning occurs if you give a demo and don't make the students make the prediction. Because weeks later, students will actually misremember the demo. It's really important for you to have in front of you the prediction when I give you the demo so that you're faced with, oh, maybe I didn't actually understand that. Maybe I got it wrong. So um, I suggest that every time we execute a piece of code it, live in front of the class, we're actually doing a demo. It's probably a good idea to have our students make predictions. Second, these seven lines of code, particularly for if you're watching this talk, this probably didn't teach you a whole lot about computer science. But I did teach you something about the way that human beings understand speech. These seven lines of code didn't teach you a lot about computer science, but they actually taught you a lot about being human. About, th about how we understand things as humans, is how our ears work. It's pretty powerful for seven lines of code. How many bits are needed to record intelligent speech, intelligible speech? Um, if you look at this code, after this code runs, in the sound, we only have two values. These are either 32,000, negative 32,000. That's one bit. It's up or it's down. We can encode we can represent intelligent speech in only one bit per sample. Do you know how many places you can hide a bit? You can easily hide sound inside of pictures and you can't possibly tell. That's a really powerful idea. Finally, none of you wrote this code. I wrote this code. I executed this code. We talked about this code. I'm hoping that you learned something from playing with this program, but you didn't actually have to write a program. It isn't necessary to write code in order to learn from code. And this is an example of teaching computer science for insights into our world, not just to teach software development skills.